Welcome, everyone. Happy Friday. My name is Dan Sutherland. I'm the Programming Chair for Canadian International Council, Saskatoon Branch. Very happy to have you here sharing this time with us in Treaty 6 territory, the traditional homeland of the Métis. I'm really excited to have you all here. You guys are, uh, uh, you are making this possible. You're, you are fulfilling the continued commitment of Canadian International Council to bring people together, to talk ideas, to have discussions. We need to have the discussions on so many of these, these aspects so that we know affect a lot of people. Um, there's, a few, there's a few things I wanted to say quick. First of all, I am, I'm doing a quick poll right now, so I want you to get ready. How many people here have been to a conference before? Raise your hands. <laughs> Just checking, one, two, five, 10, okay, good. Most of you have been some people are to a conference for the first time, and there's a few things I want to share with you about conferences that are special to me, and if you've not been to one, I think I'm, I'm hoping you'll be able to take these to heart. Um, first of all, I love conferences. I love conferences. It's why I organize so many events, and it's why I travel to so many CIC events that happen across Canada. Why do I love them? I love it because we can see transfer, uh, transformation take place in people. I think back to high school, going to high, high school conferences. There's a standard format that happens at every conference. At the beginning, you say hi to people, they're not gonna even make eye contact with you. They're, they're, keeping, they're keeping to their groups, um, they're gathering energy, they're staying in their safe space. But by the end of the conference, they're going, I love you guys. I never want to leave. You see, what happens is we get more comfortable. We start breaking through those boundaries. We start, and, and it's easier for some people than others. It is. But the important, the important thing is to try. I mean, look at the groups we have represented in the room today. We're looking at trying to solve some serious problems, serious issues. How can we improve the resettlement process? How can we show to people who aren't understanding otherwise that, that immigration and immigrants are good for our society? These are some of the things that we're looking towards coming up with answers and procedures on. And Look at the, the different groups represented here. We have Global Gathering Place. We've got Saskatoon Refugee Coalition. We've got Saskatoon Open Door Society. We have IWS represented. And uh, we have Amnesty International. We have a strong Amnesty International contingent here. And there are other groups here that I'm, I'm sorry that I'm missing, but that's because you and I, we need to have the conversation. Get comfortable in your time today. I mean, I don't expect you to be the dancing bear and say hi to everyone, but extend your comfort zone. Um, I always think that we're gonna have the, the ability to celebrate the successes of each of our groups here, but each of our groups have challenges. Each of our groups could do a few things better. One of the people that you're talking to this morning may have some of the answers to solve that for you, which is gonna make it better for all of us. So please enjoy the day. We're gonna have a great time here. I would like to introduce our chair who has a few opening remarks for this session. Alan Anderson is Professor Emeritus of Sociology and former chair of International Studies program at the University of Saskatchewan. He has served as a member of the Board of Directors of Global Gathering Place and Saskatchewan Open Door Society, and the executive of the Saskatoon branch of the Canadian International Council. He is also active in the Saskatoon Refugee Coalition and the Saskatoon branch of Amnesty International Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, Alan Anderson. Okay, before we get into the uh is this working? Okay, yeah. Before we get into the uh, session proper, I want to uh, give you an overview of uh, what's on the menu for today. Um, I also would like to uh, 
pay tribute to uh, what's turned out to be a fantastic organizing committee. Uh, Dan uh, uh, is uh, just an organizer par excellence, uh, just very experienced and uh, yeah. And, and uh, the best I've ever seen at it, uh, actually. Uh, and uh, actually, a couple of years ago, the way this whole thing got going was a couple of years ago, at least a couple of years, uh, uh, a seat at a dinner we were at uh, leaned over to me, a, a seat Sarkar, and said, you know, Alan, we, we really should have uh, a uh, conference on uh, the direction of uh, immigration policy. Um, be careful how you answer that. Uh, I mean, uh, then things developed. Of course, uh, Rob Norris uh, uh, got on board and, and just uh, extremely experienced. So, so we had a, uh, uh, a pretty effective uh, committee, and this is the uh, this is the result. Uh, with um, I'm absolutely thrilled at the uh, uh, people who uh, have uh, signed up. Uh, to, to go through this exercise, sort of think tank uh, exercise. What we have in mind is um, initially the, there are four sessions, uh, topical sessions. Uh, the first will deal with uh, fitting a national policy into the prairie community uh, reality and uh, participating in that uh, will be uh, uh, Joe uh, Garcia, uh, Rob Norris and uh, Asit Sarkar. Um, a concern there uh, was, um, of course, uh, it's fine to have a national uh, immigration policy and, for that matter, refugee policy, but how does this play out uh, in Saskatchewan? Uh, so th this is our uh, main interest, and actually we go around full circle and return to that uh, uh, at the end of the day. In the meantime, this, this second uh, session uh, later this morning uh, we deal with concerns and challenges in immigration and refugee policy, which to some extent uh, inadvertently is a reply to some of the points made by the minister. Um, but uh, what, what, are some of the, uh, uh, what are some of the concerns? Uh, how, how do we look at uh, uh, challenges in, the, uh, in immigration and refugee policy? Uh, we have a precious little time, but uh, uh, quite a lot to cover. So uh, in that session, which will be chaired by, uh, by Dan, we have uh, uh, Haida uh, uh, Amirzadeh, who's well-known uh, uh, immigration uh, uh, lawyer, uh, Bill Rafos from Amnesty International, and, uh, and myself. Um, the third session, uh, oh, in the meantime, um, uh, over lunch, uh, very kindly, the mayor, uh, Charlie Clark, has uh, said he'll say some words on behalf of the, uh, of the city, so we look forward to that. Um, the uh, first afternoon session is on settlement and integration, the Saskatchewan experience. What are the challenges faced by uh, settlement agencies who are uh, well represented uh, uh, here? There are many, many challenges, and uh, we could take all all day just uh, listing these, I think. But, uh, but, but anyway, have uh, some commentary from some some of the top people. I call them frontline workers responsible for. Okay, what do we do with with immigrants and refugees, uh, right from the get go? Uh, so uh, participating in that will be uh, uh, Ali uh, Abu uh, Abukar, who's the uh, uh, CEO of. Um, of uh, Open Door, uh, Melanie Berg, um, and one of the uh, managers from uh, uh, GGP, uh, her responsibility in the health uh, area, Helen Smith uh, McIntyre uh, from uh, the Saskatoon Refugee uh, uh, Coalition, as well as Amnesty, and April Sora, who handles immigration matters for the uh, city. Um, the final session, uh, charting an immigration policy success path for Saskatchewan, um, will uh, return back to uh, uh, the national goals and objectives of immigration policy, but how uh, particularly they play out uh, here. It's success uh, uh, at a provincial level, and there the idea is to hear uh, directly from um, uh, the business community from here are some of the success stories of um, 
uh, immigrants and for that matter, more specifically refugees who've uh, done, to say the very least, rather well uh, for themselves in this, uh, in this context. So I really, uh, really look forward uh, to that. That'll be chaired by, uh, by Rob and uh, uh, Kamenashis, uh, Deb, uh, Grant uh, Cook, uh, Sandra Ribeiro, and, and again, Asit Sarkar will be participating in, in that. Um, and uh, they're very well versed in, uh, in that whole uh, particular area. So um, moving into the um, first session, uh, as I said, this is on fitting a national policy into the prairie community reality. So to introduce that, uh, some of the topics that we suggested uh, should be covered are the rationale of the changes reflected in new goals of Canada's immigration policy, um, the uniqueness of the prairie provinces in attracting uh, immigrants, and um, beyond that, and this could uh, have national implications, what non-metropolitan centers and smaller communities across the country, including, of course, here, uh, have to offer uh, immigrants as opposed to, to larger metropolitan centers. Um, so uh, we have, uh, as I said, three panelists. Uh, they'll be speaking in, in, in this order, and I'll introduce them uh, one by one before they speak. So uh, the first um, uh, speaker is, um, is going to be uh, um, uh, Asit uh, uh, Sarkar. Um, I'll just move over to... Uh, grab this. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Yeah. Um, so a seat uh, to introduce him. Uh, he hardly needs any introduction. He's he's well known in any number of different uh, uh, venues, different capacities. He's um, a professor emeritus in the Edwards School of Business uh, here at the uh, university. He was the former director of the University of Saskatchewan International. He served as a special advisor to Saskatchewan's Minister for Advanced Education, Employment and Immigration uh, for two years. Prior to that, he was co-chair of the Board of Directors of Saskatoon Open Doors Society and currently is president of the Multicultural Council of Saskatchewan. So, that's it. Thank you very much, <coughs> Alan my colleagues and all of you uh, who are here. Um, I know a lot of you were at the um, session last night when the minister spoke, but some of you probably were not there. So my starting point would be some of the remarks that the uh, minister made. And so if I repeat some of them, please excuse those of you who were there. What I wanted to do was to start with the rationale of what I call new immigration policy for Canada, or new immigration targets. And you might say, you know, what is new about it? New, and as the minister tried to say, number one is that it is a multi-year rolling uh, target. No longer uh, there is a feeling that Canada says, well, this year we'll accept 250,000 immigrants, and Canada necessarily gets that. And sometimes more, sometimes less. Usually has been less. And one of the other points the minister made, what, why it is new, in the past, the assumption of the immigration officers and the others was that when people apply, we need to find a number of ways how to say no. And the minister said that we are, have, we are now trying to turn it completely around. We're trying to find more ways of how to say yes. And so, and the um, second uh, thing is um, Canada remains committed to a balance of economic, family, and refugee resettlement considerations. 
And it is no accident that the ministry is no longer called just um, uh, the Canadian uh, um, the Citizenship and Immigration. It is called Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship. And as you know, in the past, citizenship itself was separated sometimes from the Ministry of Immigration. And again, there are important pointers that the government is trying to communicate. We no longer want just people to be here, either as temporary foreign workers. With the temporary foreign workers, there is a path to permanent residency. There is a path from permanent residency to uh, citizenship. And same thing for all of them. So when Canada is looking at now anybody coming into the shore as a prospective immigrant or an immigrant, expectation is that they will be full citizens with full rights and opportunity to contribute to this society fully. And in the balance that the government has so far set up is that roughly 60% is uh, economic uh, refugee, uh, economic immigrants, about 25 to 27% uh, family class, and 14% refugee and other humanitarian uh, and protected persons. The level that has been suggested, as the minister said, is going from yearly 310,000 to 340,000. The recommendations of uh, Conference Board of Canada was that Canada should actually welcome over, on a rolling basis, up to 450,000 immigrants a year. And government decided not to go for that because it's too drastic, but the trend is higher. The Economic considerations are dominant, and I'll come to that why that is so. Um, but there is scope for adjustment in that in uh, provincial and regional considerations. Let me uh, tell you a little bit about what are the components of the Im uh, economic immigrants. One is called federal high-skilled. And the minister talked about global skills category. Minister talk, talked about the Canadian experience class and a number of others in that category. And that consists of uh, roughly half of all the uh, economic class targets. Who are the remainders? Uh, some in the, he referred to the Atlantic pilot program. So some uh, would fall into that immigration pilot. Some are caregivers. A large chunk, about uh, uh, roughly one third of that, is in the provinci provincial nominees. And this means, again, government has recognized that in the immigration policies, targets, and settlement approaches, selections, there is no longer one size fits all. And to me, that puts special responsibility to the provinces. And you know, following today's discussion, you might even say, is provinces enough? What is the scope for cities? What is the scope for other organizations? Is there a scope for uh, for example, universities or post-secondary organizations, if that is an important uh, determinant of the immigration. So I think it leaves a lot of scope for discussions as to how the provincial programs, provincial adjustments ought to be made in the light of the realities of this province. And later on, you know, uh, there will be discussions on that. Family class uh, in 2018 is 86,000 out of 310,000. 
and again in the family class, there is a change that is taking place. It is now recognized that having a person's spouse and children is an essential part of creating an environment where the individual is able to attend fully and look into the opportunities of what are available and contribute to where uh, the contribution is best needed. Refugee uh, um, and humanitarian targets are roughly about 50,000 or 47,000. And that is also going up gradually. And the minister pointed out that ideally, we would like to take more. Uh, but I think uh, it's important that we are getting a signal that this, what happened in 2017, that 40,000 target, it was not an accident. Uh, yes, it was done in response to the situation in Syria, but the government has taken to heart that this is the direction, this is what Canadians want, and as you go further into the uh, different categories of the refugees and protected persons, you'd see that more and more scope are being created for the private um, sponsorship options. We said, uh, and you know, a lot of people say why uh, we need the immigrants. I think a general message is, it is not the new immigrants who need to come here. It is, the, it is Canada which needs the new immigrants. It is essential for Canada. And uh, the minister used a couple of simple examples yesterday that, uh, you know, um, from four people contributing to one person's retirement now, two people would have to contribute to the retirement uh, costs and eventually one person and then he talked about that uh, essentially within about a 10 to 15 year period, the total net increase in Canada's population will have to come from immigrants. Some people might say, well, why that's important? We all know we need to, in order to everything to have everything that we like to have in Canada, there needs to be a significant economic base. And the economic base comes from not just numbers, it comes from numbers who continue to contribute to the growth of the economy. So if we are, if we like to have a growing economy, we like to have our position as a globally competitive economy, it is essential that we need to have that solid economic base. And that's why ministers, I quote the minister, increased immigration is a necessity for economic growth, community sustainability, and keeping Canada globally competitive. And he talked about settlement uh, support, increased settlement support. Just in the uh, recent uh, budget, there has been a new, um, or the commitment of a billion dollars to help new immigrants adapt to life in Canada with proper support. Many economic immigrants surpass the salaries of average Canadians within a few years of arrival. So, and I know there will be discussions on that. Oh, you know. Are they going to be a burden for us? So far, the data does not show that they are a burden for us. But you need to put in the investment initially. And that's what Canada plans to do. Just to give you some numbers on evidence of immigrants' economic performance, average immigrant age is far lower than the national median. National median is 40 years average immigrant age is 
28 years. So you know younger people have greater potential, longer time period to contribute to the economy. The employment rate of the economic class immigrants, and this includes principal applicants, spouses, and dependents, have an employment rate of about 75%. So myth about are they going to be burden on our social safety net is not correct, not supported by data. And if you look at a period of, say, 10-year period, so using the census data from 2001 to 2011, the family class had an employment rate of 63%, higher than the Canadian average, and the refugee class had an average employment rate of 58%, which is about the average of the Canadian-born population. So do not accept the myth that by accepting refugees without regard to their language skills, without regard to their education, necessarily means they are going to be a burden on all of us for a long time. And this is data from conference board in, published in 2017. So, what do we need to look at? I think we all need to say that if Canada wants to bring in more immigrants, it needs to, it needs to find ways to enhance the economic impact of immigration. Second, we need to find, doesn't matter what composition, how many refugees, how many humanitarian, how many economic class, how many family class. We must find ways to better integrate immigrants into the labor market. Third, there is a term you'd hear called absorptive capacity, and which is to the common you know, uh, knowledge or people, they would say, oh, we can't handle that many people. We don't have the capacity. Without ever thinking what goes into the concept of that capacity, it is not simply, here are 50 jobs here, so therefore capacity is to take 50. It is the totality of what we need. How can we build our societies? How can we strengthen our societies? How can we ex uh, expand our communities? Mm -hmm. How can we sustain our communities? So when you start thinking in those terms, absorptive capacity has got much greater meaning, particularly in the hearts and minds of the people who have sponsored people, who have supported people, who have helped them to find their first job. I think the final point would be what I would call having public's continued support for immigration. How do you build that support? And throughout the day, we might find ways of talking about it. But it is not simply how many people vote today for this party or that party. It is essentially for more people to understand what immigration means to our uh, current economy, future prospects, and sustaining a society and community in the way we know it and in the way we would like to. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. Uh, uh, a seat uh, for especially bringing us up to date on uh, the exact uh, uh, situation here in terms of the uh, the numbers but also the implications of uh, of all of this and uh, how important this is to uh, 
to Canada. Um, I'll call on uh, Rob Norris uh, uh, next. Uh, Rob was the past minister of advanced education, employment, and immigration in uh, the provincial uh, government here, um, formerly in the University of Saskatchewan International Office. Uh, currently, he is senior strategist for partnerships at this university. Rob? Alan, thanks very much. If it's all right, I'm going to uh, just going to walk a little bit as long as, as long as I'm not interfering too much with the with the camera angle. First of all, thanks very much, everyone, for uh, for coming out on uh, on this Friday in in Saskatoon, and uh, to everyone on this panel, a special thanks for for your insights. You can you can get a sense. Uh, Dr. Sarkar was my special advisor on immigration, so you'd get a sense. I thought I'd be working hard all week, come home, and maybe he and I would go for breakfast. I think, man, I can relax for a bit. He would do this every Saturday morning. The lessons would begin. Because for as much as we were making progress, and we were, there was so much more to do and so much more to understand the intricacies were, were something akin to like a Rubik's Cube. Every piece that we would move would affect another piece. And it took us a, a long time to try to understand some of the interrelationships. So the first thing about immigration in Canada that I learned as a student, but then it really came to attention as a minister, was Section 95, concurrent powers. There are two listed if I'm not mistaken, agriculture and immigration. Both go back to a founding vision of what's going to be very significant for Canada. So regarding immigration, it means no matter what we wanted to do, we were going to constantly be in a state of negotiation. Some of the imperative, some of the push, they'd come from us, what we wanted. Some would come from Ottawa. And we would all have to respond. So what were we going to do? So I'll put it in kind of political science terms. There's an orientation. Every government has an orientation. And then you can think about objectives and instruments. That sounds kind of cold. But the orientation of our government as we were elected was global in focus. Joel will have the numbers, but Saskatchewan we had maybe about 1,500 people coming into the province 2007, 2008. As I was made minister, I said, we've got to move. The first year, 2,900 principal applicants and their families came into the system. That's almost doubling one year. And that was without setting a target. So we had an orientation. We were going to be globally engaged. But without targets, there was going to be no way to be able to engage a reasonable dialogue. So the first thing we did was, let's set a target. Our initial target was, let's move from about 3,000 up to 3,400 principal applicants, with the knowledge that with their families, that's going to be kind of 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 people. And if we could do that, we could set some credibility in Ottawa. Because I, I'll offer this very cautiously without telling too many tales out of, out of school. Saskatchewan was not highly regarded around the table of immigration ministers at my first meeting. What are you doing? Stealing the muffins in the back? Why are you here? I'm being a little bit facetious. But only a little bit. Manitoba had a very, very strong program. And we sat in a very, very quiet corner. So I said, the first thing we have to do is we've got to change that. So targets. And that began. When we began to set those targets, no one in Ottawa was worried about what Saskatchewan was going to do through the provincial nominee program. Within about 18 months, they had capped our program. We had gone from less than 1% of newcomers 
coming to Saskatchewan out of that Canadian pie. At the time, I think it was 265,000. And we were moving up to 3%. And guess what? Other provinces began to feel that. Welcome to a national pan-Canadian dialogue. And it's a zero-sum dialogue. The numbers that a seat's just referenced, now we're talking about 310,000. Conference board says you can move up to almost half a million. But it's zero-sum. All of the categories. Setting targets was really important. But it was only the start. What were we going to do to encourage settlement? To encourage more rapid processing? Well, I had to get out in the field. So a seat recommended to me in 2008, as we were beginning to really think about the need for a strategy, a strategy we would roll out, I'd launch at Greystone Heights School in 2009. But a seat said, no, no, the session's done, out you go. So he had me go with some employers, and over the course of two and a half weeks, I went to the Philippines, stopped in Hong Kong, flew home, but they wouldn't let me go home, flew to Toronto, went to a job fair, came home, grabbed another suitcase, and went to Ukraine. Welcome to an immersion. And I went to the interviews, and I saw thousands of people line up. And no matter where I went, I would see thousands of people. I'll never forget 20,000 people lining up in Ireland. Their families and their kids looking for a new opportunity. You live with that every day. So we were going to need to do some things differently. So what did the largest city in the province have? We had fantastic settlement agencies, but within our provincial office, we had two or three officials. I said, that didn't make a lick of sense. We're going to have to get an immigration office of some significance here. And so I moved the entire entrepreneurship branch from Regina to Saskatoon. Not that they would only deal with immigration through the entrepreneurship stream, but they would actually provide a foundation for us to offer far greater services. That was a very, very interesting conversation when the mayor of Regina called me. You can guess how supportive he was <laughs> of that move. You see, begin, begins that feedback. We're going to need to do some things differently, but not everyone's going to be happy with that. Then we came up with a notion as part of that strategy. We're going to have to get more people, not simply in Saskatoon and Regina. And I'll give you an example. The entrepreneurship stream. It offered kind of government-led missions for those newcomers that wanted to potentially own and operate a business here, and they could visit Saskatoon and Regina. I looked around my caucus room. I said, uh, hmm, got a lot of people here from more than Saskatoon and Regina. And then all, all facetiousness aside, I looked across the province. And I said, if people aren't encouraged, investors aren't encouraged to go to Weyburn or, or Prince Albert or Swift Current or Moose Jaw or Tisdale, then how are we going to grow the province? I said, you've got to change that. You've got to get out of the way. We don't need to have the role of government. And suddenly we began to have a conversation. What's the public policy problem or opportunity? And what's the role of the state? And we, as a provincial government, were getting in the way of success. So I began to make programmatic changes and procedural changes. Some people didn't like those. And I said, it doesn't matter whether you like them or not. If you don't like the questions I'm raising, bring me better questions and better solutions. 
and suddenly the branch began to change. We became, I think, far more engaged. The federal government said, we, we need to encourage more settlement outside of large cities. And we agreed with that. In fact, a report that I referenced last night, the report that had the subtitle of kind of success, immigration successes in the hinterland, yeah, I, I would put that up everywhere I went, especially when I was in Ottawa. Hi, I'm here from the hinterland. Fast scoring province in the country. So, we came up through negotiation with Ottawa on a notion of 11 gateways for Saskatchewan. 11 first stops for newcomers, regardless of the category. Sounds simple. Some folks in Ottawa and folks in Regina said, great, where should we book the space? I said, no, 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 no. There's one thing I'm not going to allow. These will not be in government offices. What's the role of the state? Because I think at four o'clock or five o'clock on a Friday afternoon, I think that's when real challenges might begin for people. Let's engage community partners, like the Open Door Society in Saskatoon. And partners across the province put their hands up and said, we'd like to engage that challenge. Let us own that. And Ottawa was happy with that. So we opened 11 gateways with community partners and something incredible began to happen. New ideas about what successful settlement could look like began to take a community-filled flavor. So in Swift Current, that office was downtown. And they began to do work with some of the First Nations in the area. And we began to see intercultural successes I want to touch on this because it's very important. We're sitting in Treaty 6 territory, traditional home of the Métis. It's so important. Saskatchewan began to change. We began to grow. It wasn't perfect. I remember the day, and, and it's bothersome when we think about the vandals that broke in to the child care facility, open door facility in, in Regina. And they vandalized the playground equipment. And I wrote an op-ed piece into the Leader Post and said, no, you can't write those things. You don't say those things. These are our kids. So we had to take that head on. And that's part of the role of this conversation, is to take on those myths, those stereotypes while we were continuing to do the work with all of you on what could be successful settlement in Saskatchewan. So I was at a 7-Eleven in Regina one morning picking up a newspaper and I saw a racially charged situation between a newcomer and someone from our indigenous communities. I learned a lot from that exchange. We were gonna to have to do a lot of work. We were all gonna to have to do a lot of work. And an organization in Regina came to me and said, could we try something? You know, because of this experience on settlement, and we were pushing hard, I wanted to move from a paper-based system I wanted people to be able to do more work, just as the minister said, said, as they were leaving their home countries before they even arrived. And then we discovered something. And this organization said, could we take some of your lessons learned from successful settlement? And could we actually work with our indigenous communities? Because you know, the very questions you're asking, maybe we could help with. So before someone leaves a rural or remote community in Saskatoon, or Saskatchewan rather, Maybe we should make sure they have a health card. 
Maybe they have a SIN card. Maybe there's pre-employment training that can occur. And sure enough, we had some organizations take that lead role. And what I saw was a society changing. Not because the government told it to, because our motto from many people's strengths, well, it just meant we were naturally there, but we were gonna have to work. And this is one of the elements, is that immigration is not an accidental activity. It's a purposeful activity. You need an orientation, like the one Saskatchewan has. You need objectives. You need to be able to hold your government to account. And the government needs to be able to count on community-based partners. We need new instruments that carry out activities, but they don't all need to be owned by the state. And that helps to explain those three or four changes. They help to explain why the success of our immigration strategy continues, not perfectly. There's a lot of room for improvement. Not simply in counting more numbers, though we need them, but actually being able to count on our neighbors and have them count on us. Your work and your interest in this has helped to change and continues to help change Saskatchewan, but it's also helped change the notion of what Saskatchewan represents in Ottawa, and around the world, a welcoming place. And the last point I want to raise is this. Talk a lot about the economic driver of immigration. And that's important. Let's call it enlightened self-interest. But we found something else out. So you have a strong economy. But that's not the end of the story. It's the beginning of the story because the strong economy actually led to stronger growing communities. And this was part of the magic. that We didn't quite know, we had a sense, we didn't quite know as we got started, but we actually saw it happen. And so greater inclusion, greater cultural awareness, and frankly, just more fun within communities across the province. Part of what happened is we lost some of our fear as we invited our new neighbors to go to hockey games with us and maybe go to the occasional rider game. So a special thanks for the opportunity to talk a little bit about some of these changes. But orientation matters. As the seat says, doesn't matter about what party, but make sure you ask a question. Are you globally engaged or not? We don't take that for granted anymore, 2018. Do you have clear objectives? What's your relationship with grassroots groups? What's your relationship with Ottawa? And how can we all work together to help ensure that we have a greater and more enriched understanding of what successful settlement looks like? Because based on my visit to Toronto in some of those communities, where we actually went and said to people, you can stay here in Toronto if you want. And they were almost all newcomers, by the way. Or you can come to Saskatchewan and have a far higher quality of life and be home in about 10 minutes. And the uptake that we got in Toronto, in newcomer communities, was remarkable. Because people were just interested in what was best for their kids, their families, and for their own futures. I'm delighted to be able to uh, be here and in, in, to be in such august company. Alan, thank you. Well, thanks, Rob. Um, the uh, third member of this troika is uh, 
going to be Joe Garcia, who has the distinct advantage of being able to correct everything that his predecessors uh, said. Uh, seriously, though, Joe is a professor and uh, past head of political studies at the U of S. Uh, he's the chair of the Executive Committee uh, for Immigration Research West, a research network focused on examining immigration settlement and integration issues in Western Canada. He has conducted research into immigration, citizenship, and multiculturalism. Joe. Thank you, Marlon. <clears throat> well, good, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I want to start by thanking I want to start by thanking Dan, um, but Dan, are you sure you're going to conferences and not parties when people were saying that <laughs> what they were saying about loving each other and wanting to get together again? <laughs> um, well, I'm glad you've gone to some good conferences. I have too. <laughs> um, and I'm honored, really honored, and I say this most sincerely, to be here with um, uh, Rob and uh, Asit. And uh, the reason is that they really have been uh, um, exceptional uh, leaders and champions of immigration in this province and um, multiculturalism and all the things that are good. Uh, and uh, I, um, I want to endorse um, um, Rob's uh, observation that Manitoba used to be the poster child of uh, uh, the pro among the provinces of you know progressive, proactive immigration, and the federal government would bring Manitoba everywhere. Every conference, there was a presentation by Manitoba, nationally and internationally. And I kept saying to the guys here, you gotta become a poster child, you know? And then you, two things happen. Not only do you get profile, but you also get benefits from Ottawa. They will treat you a lot better if you become the poster child. And uh, Rob, you managed to do that. So that's immense. And uh, Rob, uh, Rob is absolutely right. Um, uh, I was studying uh, immigration here when we did have uh, uh, 1,500 uh, arrivals. Uh, most of you know better than me, and it's particularly Helen. Most of those were refugees at the time, and um, uh, probably 80% of them were refugees, and 50% uh, and, uh, of them would leave the province every year. So we'd, between just Saskatoon and Regina, we'd end up with essentially 350 people each. And we went from that essentially tenfold to almost 15,000 in more recent years. Now, Rob, there's no doubt that we needed those people and that those people came largely because of the boom, but it wouldn't have happened without your, your enlightenment. So thank you very, very much and I see the support. I really mean that from the bottom of my heart. Um, and uh, so having said that, now I'm gonna criticize them now. <laughs> It was a great setup, huh? Uh, no, no, no. Actually, uh, 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 it's a pleasure to go last because um, um, now they've said most of what they've the, what needs to be said, and I can just reflect on a few uh, on a few points. Um, those are all important things. They're really truly exceptional uh, presentations, and I'll, I'll just build on on those if I can just find my password here. Um, And let me just say while I'm doing this uh, that uh, I'm also going to dispel some myths, as you guys have. And uh, I'm going to talk about um, uh, absorptive capacity a little bit more than you have. And I will also talk about uh, capitalizing on um, what Rob, I think uh, you were referring to as competitive advantage and that we have to do better in areas where we don't have a competitive advantage, right? So uh, I'll, I'll talk about some of those. So mine is a bit of a think piece. Um, don't worry, not many numbers. I had a beautiful power play, uh, PowerPoint to uh, show you guys, but we don't have the PowerPoint. If anybody wants my PowerPoint, just give me a note and I'll send it to you. Uh, so I want to dispel myths, um, and I am uh, basically have uh, um, five sections. Dispel myths. Um, uh, the we, we need policy improvement, alignment, and coherence in order to, in order to make uh, the, our provincial policy fit within the national policy. We need strategies that are morally and ethically sound. So I'm going to talk about morality and ethical um, 
components of what we do. And I'm also going to talk about strategies that are sensitive to absorptive capacity and can enhance absorptive capacity. So I'm going to talk about that. And finally, I'm going to talk about uh, who is responsible for success of immigration program. And uh, you alluded to that a little bit. The answer is we all are. <laughs> and uh, and I'll, 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 talk, I'll talk a little bit about that. So just five major sections, and I'll, I'll start with dispelling the myths. Um, one myth is that um, the lack of perfect fit between the federal policy and provincial policy is the fault of the federal government. We put a lot of responsibility for what wrong at, at the altar of the federal government. And the reality is that it's also the fault of the provincial governments, and it's also the fault of many other agencies and entities, like the ones that won't move when you say, move, please, we need, we need your help. So there's a, there's a shared, shared blame, if you will, um, if we're going to play the blame game. Uh, so um, that there's also a myth that there's a perfect fit, that, uh, that there's something, you know, it's like in, in, our, in our mind's eye, we think that there's the perfect immigration program. And surely to God, if we can divine it, all those highly paid bureaucrats and politicians should be able to do the same. And the truth is that a perfect fit is not possible. And it's not possible because it's really complicated. And to get the perfect puzzle, you're going to have to work at it for thousands of years. It's, it's, a, it's a work in progress. And you'll always get criticism. You always get, and, and there's also in public policy something called multi-value choice. What I value, and I have a thousand different values that I bring to bear on immigration, and you have a thousand values, and you have a thousand, I'll be like Oprah for a minute, and you have a thousand <laughs> values, right? You know, so you multiply those, and there are millions and millions of values. And how do you, re how do you reconcile all those things? You know, and, but, but yet we sit there and we focus on one little atom, and we think, yeah, there it is, I can fix that little atom, and you know, and you know exactly how you want it. And it just doesn't work that way. So we have, to, we have to recognize that because to a large extent, the dissent and then the rebellion and the backlash against immigration is largely as a result of that, that people see that you can't fix it, you can't improve it, and they dwell much more on what's problematical and, and they, they can't accept gray areas and they can't accept the imperfection. And God knows our entire world and our entire life is imperfect. This university is imperfect, let me tell you. We're not going to shut the doors down. <laughs> We're not going to shut the doors and kick everybody out or keep everybody out, you know? So um, there's, um, uh, and, and, and getting a fit between the federal and provincial policies is not easy. Um, there's a, also a myth that we actually know what we want, we know what we need, and we know what is best for us. And you know what? We don't. We're a little bit like young kids and teenagers that think they know it all. And there's nothing to learn. And we just want, we want the autonomy and we want the money, the, you know, the allowance. And just leave me alone, mom and dad. You know? <laughs> right? And that's not the case. So we have to be mindful of that. And uh, the, there's also the, the myth that we have a consensus on policy goals and objectives. You know, we Saskatchewan people know what we want. We have a consensus. We have an agreement here. We have a, well, you know, we have a vision or we have a, an orientation, and we, we know exactly. Uh, it, everybody has orientations, and we don't have a singular vision. We don't have consensus. Uh, well, that's why we have politics. <laughs> Rob made a career of it. <laughs> um, and a good one. Um, so, um, what must we do? Uh, we must work on improving, uh, on policy improvement, alignment and coherence. And uh, I've got a long list of policies here. There are 12 of them, and then there are many more you could all add. <laughs> but what we need is we need to take uh, not a, um, a single policy approach, but a multi-policy approach, a system-wide approach. So, um, and this was alluded to, but in addition to immigration and settlement and integration policy, those are the three core ones that we're focusing on, in order for those to work, we also have to link them and align them 
and make them coherent with population policy, economic development policy, community development policy, social policy, aboriginal policy, education policy, housing policy, and on and on and on. There's got to be an alignment. There's got to be a coherence. You can't do it just by dealing with immigration in its own in isolation. It's part and parcel of something. There's a system. We've got to take a systems approach. Uh, we must develop uh, immigration settlement integration strategies that are rooted in ethics and morality. Uh, there's a lot of people that think that the moral, the only morality that's required is making the bottom line, is you know, making the buck. And as long as it's, it, that it becomes an economic transaction, and as long as everybody's making money, hey, what else is there, right? But ethics and morality are important. And I'll, I'll tell you what they're important for. First and foremost, we have to take into account what impact immigration has on indigenous peoples and communities. If we're not taking care of the people who are already here, and that's both indigenous, uh, long-standing settlers, and newcomers, at the same time, we're going to run into problems. It's going to be criticized, there's going to be backlash, there's going to be resentment. You'll never develop that, you know, that mutually supportive symbiotic relationship and empathetic uh, relationship that you need. Um, we have to think about the impact on other individuals and groups uh, in the province, especially, especially the economically and socially marginalized and vulnerable people. We can't bring people over and bring them up if we can't do something about bringing up the people who are already here. And guess what? Um, in many cases, the people who are here are, 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 are immigrants and newcomers. They're settlers, too. They just happen to have come on an earlier bus, you know? And so when we're talking about taking care of everyone, we're really talking about taking care of the ones who arrived on the previous bus. Um, and uh, the impact um, on immigrants and refugees themselves, you know, Ethically and morally is a right to bring people here if we're not going to do the best that we can for them. Is our only goal to maximize population and profit? And the heck what the consequences are with you know, the human cost to these people? I think that's known as slavery. And the impact on source countries, you've all heard about the brain drain. And so, you know, if we want, do we want the cream of the crop and just, just rape and pillage like the good old days? <laughs> or is there going to be restitution? Is there going to be compensation? Is there going to be, you know, um, mutual, mutual benefits, symbiotic relationship? And uh, I could go on and talk about the merits of going for the cream of the, you know, the cream of the crop and going for people who are more at the bottom. My, my, my family came at the bottom. We were not the cream of the crop. And uh, we, we, we appreciated what we, had, what, what we had. We weren't frustrated by where everyone was at different stages in their lives. And we always worked towards, you know, improving our quality of life and our standing. Um, um, I just got a couple more slides. Um, so absorptive capacity, what is it? Um, we have to be very sensitive to that. And, uh, um, and we have to be sensitive to it because uh, it refers to the right amount of load that a system can handle before the system starts to being stressed, dysfunctional, or could fail completely. And you know what's happening in Europe what they're experiencing is um, stress. You know, the anti-immigrant movement is about stress, and they're becoming somewhat dysfunctional as a result of their reaction to the to the stress. They're not dealing it with with it very well. But um, uh, so 
there are three different types, at least three different types of absorbative capacity. Most people are familiar with the economic absorbative capacity, and that is how many people can be absorbed into the economy. But there's also what I would call social absorbative capacity. How many people can be absorbed, especially people of difference, can be absorbed into the, into the society, right? So how much diversity can a society tolerate before it starts going, oh God, you know, like happened in Vancouver. Uh, the Oriental people are taking over the so-called monster houses and, you know, and the loss of um, language identity and so on that started to sort of manifest itself there. The third one is uh, environmental impact. Most of, most of you probably don't know, but you know that uh, one of the requirements under immigration policy is uh, actually it's under the, the federal government's uh, uh, environmental impact policy. Even immigration policy has to go through an environmental impact assessment. And, and then, you, you know, at first I used to scratch my head and go, what the heck, you know, why are these immigrants eating the trees, you know, what, are they, what is going on? Why, why do you have to do an environmental impact? But I think it's about, you know, size of population and so on. But, uh, so those are the three major impacts, and I just want to make a couple of observations about that, and that is, um, there, the, there's an assumption, there's a question, how elastic or inelastic, to use economic terms, is absorptive capacity. There's some people who think that it's not elastic, that it's fixed. You only have so much absorptive capacity in the economy, and you only have so much absorptive capacity in the society, and you only have so much absorptive capacity in the environment. And I'm of the view that absorptive capacity is elastic. And that is, you can increase it or decrease it depending on what you do and how you do things. And so what we, I think, need to do is to make sure, and you guys alluded to this, we have to make sure that we do things that will expand the absorbed capacity, economic absorbed capacity, that's what you referred to in, when you raised the point, and, uh, and Rob, to some, to, to, to some extent, to the social um, and cultural kind of absorbed, of, absorbed capacity. Um, and in order to do that, you need good economic management and you need good political management. If you have good economic management, you can figure out how to create economic development opportunities that benefit everyone and will benefit newcomers and will need more newcomers. And it will increase your population. It will deal with your, with your um, uh, dependency ratio of how many people you have supporting, working people you have supporting uh, a person who's retired and supporting the social safety net, right? And, and so it's got a, and, and you need political managers who will go out there and do what Rob was doing, <laughs> as he said, unabashedly so, and basically saying immigration is good, and the minister as well, right? The immigration is good. Don't, you know, if, you've, if, if you want to hate something, look somewhere else, because there's nothing here to hate, you know? <laughs> right? And that's political management. You have to make people appreciate, and you have to put the value proposition to them. Um, and what did the minister do last night? He said, you don't like immigration? Well, who's going to pay for your pension? <laughs> right? That's, there's a value proposition. That's political management. He's raising consciousness and making people understand that it's in your self-interest. Even if you don't have a heart, you have a wallet. And if you care about your wallet, you know, you're going to bring in immigrants. All right? Okay. And uh, I just, um, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be done in just a second. So the province must be proactive and progressive. Um, and uh, not just the province, but um, uh, we need to negotiate federal provincial agreements that are truly serves all of its purposes. Um, I think uh, um, we must... Uh, develop good uh, immigration settlement integration policies and programs, and we must then engage and animate all key stakeholders in every sector, which what what you said, Asit, so I won't, uh, and that includes the media, religious groups, uh, you know, uh, in addition to some of the ones that you listed. Uh, and uh, let me just go down. So, uh, I'm. this is my last, uh, my last uh, slide here. Uh, so the question is, who is responsible for the success of immigration? 
And I'm going to quote you guys uh, a line that I'm sure most of you know from Shakespeare's play, uh, Caesar. And uh, you might remember when, uh, uh, I, I don't know, I think, it was, I think it was Anthony and Brutus. Um, and uh, they're talking, and uh, he, uh, one of them, uh, probably Anthony, says, our fate, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. Right? Our fate, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. And so the success of, and I'm going to paraphrase that, the success of immigration policy, dear friends, you're all friends, and if you're not, I want to be, <laughs> uh, dear friends, is not in the jurisdiction and hands of the federal government alone. Uh, it's not in the, um, uh, alone, but in the jurisdiction and hands of our provincial government, our municipal governments, all key stakeholders, and ultimately, in each of us individually. Thank you very much. Well, it's very obvious that we have a panel of, uh, of experts here, but I'm absolutely awed scanning the uh, crowd here that you yourselves are, in a sense, a, a panel of experts. Uh, there's a lot of expertise uh, uh, out there. So uh, we have uh, about 15 minutes or, or so uh, to uh, fire away. Uh, throughout this conference, we want to leave a reasonable amount of time. Of course, it won't be reasonable because we never have enough time, but uh, for feedback uh, uh, from yourselves, feedback from the, the floor. So please uh, plunge in. Any uh, questions or points you want to raise for further discussion and elaborate, elaboration? Yeah, Karen. I think this was a theme which ran through all the presentations, which was how multi-leveled questions of immigration are. And I think in Joe's comments, he emphasized the sort of challenges for creating a coherent policy of, you know, primarily the challenge of alignment. And so reflecting on the minister's comments from yesterday, I wondered what other mechanisms can be developed to create that sort of alignment of interest between different groups. I mean, obviously, uh, deaf political management is an important part of that. but. Are there institutional frameworks which can be developed to create that alignment across the country, within provinces, uh, to create you know, a way for all those moving parts to come together to create a more effective and therefore successful and therefore popular immigration policy? Uh, the second is just a quick question following up on uh, one of uh, Joe's last points regarding the importance of making uh, the value proposition for immigration. And I agree that that is how the argument needs to be made and that there's very good data as all of our speakers pointed out for that case. The one concern I have is how does one make the same argument in the uh, context of humanitarian resettlement? Um, and this, of course, speaks to the question of ethics and morality and the importance of that. But our humanitarian obligations aren't supposed to rest merely on our self-interest, uh, although perhaps there is a way of cultivating a sense of identity which supports that sort of self-interest. So I wonder if you guys could speak to that dimension of, you know, immigration, but specifically the humanitarian dimension, and how the case can be made for continuing Canada's prior tradition of supporting that. I'll, I'll, if I may, I'll, I'll just uh, deal with the first one, because something popped to my mind. If nothing popped to my mind, I would have turned to Rob. Uh, <laughs> but something did pop into my mind with your first question, uh, uh, Kieran, and that is um, the, uh, uh, as you know, uh, uh, over the last few years, the uh, the federal government has been developing what are known as LIPS, um, um, local immigrant partnerships. And uh, I'm glad to say that we now will have one here in Saskatoon. And uh, thanks to a lot of hard work by April and everyone who supported her, uh, and those of you who uh, who supported her in this room, and I know many of you who have. And but um, so that's the institutionalization is happening. Right, a mechanism. The question, and I, and I'm, I'm, a, I mean, I'm in great support of a great supporter of that, but I do have one concern, and that is, how 
well will we be, will we be able to use that mechanism? How effectively will we be able to use that mechanism? Because the, 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 the purpose of that, that uh, of a LIP is not, is, is basically to be a, a facilitator, to be a, an animator, to be, um, uh, to foster partnerships and uh, put out their uh, uh, partners, uh, you know, um, uh, value propositions and get partners enthused and engaged and, and get a lot of goodwill and, and all kinds of investments in immigration and in immigrants and refugees. So, um, so you know, if they build it, will they come? <laughs> and if they come, will they do good work? And that is my one concern, and but and my plea, if uh, a lip, when the lip gets going, please uh, take advantage of that particular institutional base to begin to to continue to contribute to uh, the mission. Uh, so I'll stop with that thought. <coughs> There are, uh, there are a couple of elements on the alignment piece that are increasingly important. And, and uh, Joe, it's something akin probably to the work of Sisyphus. I mean, it, this is just continual work. The alignment piece is even more complex when we think about our international partners, and I use that very purposefully. So with the Philippines, they have a national imperative to be very, very engaged and active in the, the dialogue in and around immigration. So for Saskatchewan, I don't know whether it's still in existence or not, but I signed uh, a memorandum of understanding. And it was based on ethical practices. I'll need to be very careful here, but I'll see if I can put a context on this. So another province had gone into a community in that country, in the Philippines, and essentially had gone to a hospital and essentially had hired people out of that hospital to come and work in their province. That's a problem. We can get very philosophical about, about brain drain. Um, but when we begin to think about very specific caregivers, healthcare practitioners being hired off the floor, this is, we have an issue, an issue of, uh, that affects their communities and families. It obviously has a, a great reputational risk for, for Canada. No one really um, begins by looking at the province, they begin by looking at which country did that. So we put in place an ethical framework on recruitment to help address some of those environmental concerns. And I don't want to be particularly focused on that one other province. It's an ongoing enterprise around the world. So by the time I went to Ukraine, we made sure we were also working in accordance with the International Organization for Migration. So this, this alignment piece is very important within the Canadian context, but it's also, I think, absolutely crucial as, as we have uh, a far more purposeful and focused strategy to engage our international partners. So for the Philippines at the time, the government was all right because they said, there's a net benefit on remittance. So they also had a notion what was in their national interest. And so we were able to have an alignment of interests. And increasingly, I guess, that, that's where I would go. And, and this is where it, Joe's absolutely right. There are a thousand variables and another thousand variables. But if you can begin to understand potential alignments in interest, then I think there's at least room for ongoing dialogue. It's not that there aren't problems, but you can at least engage in a dialogue. And that MOU we had began to put a frame around it with our international partners. And, and 
That allowed for us to engage in a different discussion with uh, Canadian immigration officials on the ground in Manila. And that, that affected our relationship in Ottawa. We were very serious about this endeavor. Again, it wasn't, it wasn't perfect, it wasn't without problems, but, but it set a tone. So I think that alignment piece, if we, if we think about it starting here, we just need to remember that it extends all the way over to someone else's home. And we, need to, we just need to be cognizant of that, and, and everyone in this room is and understands it. But that's a very important part of the story for us to also tell. It leads to the second piece, the value proposition. It's very easy for us to begin conversations of public policy, especially immigration, with what I call instrumental overtones. This is in our interest. So I would often think about an expression phrased by John Donne, and it's, it's gendered now, but it's no man is an island, no person is an island. You know, one of the defining features, I think, of us, the minister made reference to it, who hasn't had a vehicle stuck in Saskatchewan? <laughs> no one asks what you do, what your job is, what you're driving. We all just kind of get out and push and nudge and shovel and because we all kind of know that tomorrow that's probably us. And so I think that value proposition actually, we need to put less emphasis on the word proposition and more word on the value piece. And I think that comes from, I think, an inherent instinct for empathy. But we get a lot of mixed messages in these days of, of mixed messages coming from very, very high places. Empathy really matters. Uh, this is Ashfaq from Sask Saskatoon Open Door. And uh, I have two quick questions. One is for Rob and the other one is for Joe. And uh, Rob, thank you very much uh, Like uh, the wonderful work you have done in the last so many years in, uh, in immigration. And uh, I'm one of the products uh, indirectly. Like I was in Vancouver and uh, you said, oh, you can bring the families in. I said, let's move to Saskatchewan. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, what I find is uh, it was a paradigm shift that uh, you tried to bring in in the immigration in, in the province. And if we look back into 100 years in the province, as you gave the example of uh, uh, agriculture and immigration, and when we had the families coming in large, and one of the approaches you adopted was the family stream. And it was very popular. And uh, but all of a sudden we know for some reasons we changed that stream with a new direction, and uh, at ground we see the consequences too. Uh, the people who were coming to the provinces that has kind of uh, slowed down a little bit from other provinces, and so how we could change that a little bit uh, so that we could create a, some striking balance between the two. The other question is to uh, Joe. Uh, so I think you touched a little bit on um, what I should say that uh, social engineering, uh, immigration and uh, social engineering, and looking into the First Nation population. And uh, we know those are the challenges. And uh, there's an academic discussion around it. And how we can improve on that so that there be a balance between the two. Thank you. You know, I think this one's working. Um, I think we had some, some really interesting and innovative initiatives through the SIMP, and, and much of that thanks goes to Dr. Sarkar and those Saturday morning lectures and <laughs> sessions, because he would spend the week uh, out amongst all of you and, and many others and kind of bring back feedback and then he would put it in a very rigorous format that we had to understand conceptually so that we could actually take it back on Monday morning. My, my Monday morning conversations, my goal was to always have more information and new information that I could bring to my officials so that we could make improvements. On the family class changes, we, we had a couple issues. The first, very explicitly, is that it was and remains a largely federally determined 
envelope. We can push, we can negotiate, but at the time, there were very real pressures coming out of Ottawa. And they wanted to reduce, for example, the number of students within the SINP because they had set up a brand new federal student stream. I was a little bit perplexed by that because a seat had come up with, I think, one of the best ideas in Canada about keep allowing students after they graduated to stay for a longer period of time in Saskatchewan. We were making real progress. And suddenly, Ottawa said, no, no, you're, you're using your SIMP. Remember, by this time, we've got a cap. I think the cap was at 4,000. We wanted 6,000. So we'll give you a little bit more on the cap, but fewer of those are going to be students. We'll give you a little bit more on the cap, but you need to change your family class category. And we were put in a very, very difficult position. We want more people. The immediate families could come, but they were going to begin to stream and put an emphasis on family class as they categorized it through federal categories. And that became a very, very difficult proposition. If I was, if I was to offer a recommendation, and that is we, we uh, and I should have been far more aggressive in attempting to defend what we had put in place, but the work, uh, the environment, the labor force pressures were so severe at the time that we're at 4,000. We were a bit of a favored child. We were getting extra every year very quietly because not every province was using its allocation. But we needed to make progress. But the trade-off was we gave up elements of what was very important for us. And that, that's just one of the trade-offs in, in, you know, in hindsight. Could I and should I have done a better job? Yes. But we didn't initiate that. Those were pressures that came with Ottawa. And I don't blame them. They were attempting to respond to other pressures. And if you look across the immigration portfolio, whether Saskatchewan is 100% happy today or not happy today, again, even at our peak, we're at 4%. You know, can you manage this? And it began, yeah, we can manage this, but can we get a higher number? And these are some of the trade-offs, and, and I'm happy to, to look kind of uh, and reflect on it because we didn't we didn't get it a hundred percent right, but that was the impetus for some of the changes in the family class category. Um, it, I'm I'm just gonna add, thank Rob for God. It's good to have you here, Rob. Today, um, I, I wish my I wish I had the tape recorder because it, it, Rob's telling us the inside scoop on everything. Um, I I and and Rob. Rob said that the federal government had other sort of objectives that it had to deal with as well. And I'm just gonna tell you guys one, and Rob can correct me if I'm wrong, but I seem to recall one of the problems that the federal government had was a backlog. And they, the federal government wanted Saskatchewan and other provinces to fish for immigrants within the backlogged pool. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that was part of the problem, that there were two pools that were expanding and it was not helping, and so it had their, they had their own particular objectives, and so um, I'm, I'm, I'm not apologizing for the federal government, I'm just explaining <laughs> whether it was right or wrong. Uh, in terms of aboriginals, uh, Alan asked me to keep it short. Um, the, uh, look, you know, it's remarkable, think about it. Um, when uh, treaties and when the settlers arrived and were received, and, and I think aboriginals thought it was gonna be a balanced kind of shared community with balanced populations, and despite the everything atrocities that were committed to make sure that there was an imbalance, and the, you know, what 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 the settlers did in terms of, you know, not just bringing a trickle, but basically a waves after wave, and you know, we call them waves of immigration. The Aboriginals have never said, and do not say, shut it off. 
It's the Europeans who are saying that, but not, not the indigenous people here. You know what the indigenous people here are saying, and this I think speaks to the heart of it, is um, the, don't do things at our expense. Don't forget us. And so what they're asking for is uh, in whether it's jobs, whether it's uh, you know support services, and so on, you know, just make sure that we 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 get our you know a reasonable share, and that's in, I think continues to be incredibly generous of them. And in fact, the other thing I should say is many uh, Aboriginals understand that uh, regardless of what how we got here, that immigration is also beneficial for them, and they're actually very supportive of immigration and. Everybody's making a lot of efforts now to get that reconciliation of newcomers, and, and so there's a lot of good things going on. But, but keep that in mind. Think about it. I hope, you know, this is about provoking thinking, right? Have you ever heard uh, an Aboriginal say, you know, stop, you know, shut the tap off? No, what I've heard him say is, can you treat us a little bit better? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, sorry, can I have a one question? <laughs> Sorry, we're already five minutes into our break time, and these chairs aren't getting any softer. Uh, <laughs> okay. The next session begins at, uh, at uh, 10.45, so uh, please stretch, uh, have some coffee or whatever, and uh, be back here in about 10 minutes, please. And, and if you want to ask a question, you can just come up and just yeah. chat with us and over coffee, sure. Yeah.